All right. Um, yeah, uh, we're going to be talking about the origins of the web, but especially design on the web using CHSS, cascading HTML style sheets proposed by Hokum Lee in 1994. This email is still archived online. You can go read it. I recommend it. It's fascinating, uh, the original design of the language. But this wasn't the only proposal for design on the web, and it wasn't the first proposal for design on the web. Uh, it was actually based on several existing proposals, uh, like the one built into the Viola browser, uh, or this uh, easily parsable format, where I have no idea what's going on, fo fa ti per psi equals 14, I don't know. Um, but CSS solved a major problem for this new platform, not a technical problem exactly, but a philosophical problem, political, like all the decisions that we make when we're designing a new platform or interface. Uh, the first web browser uh, developed by CERN um, called the Hypermedia WWW Browser and Editor was developed for the next machine with this fancy graphic interface. But you can't make a web that's worldwide by saying it works on my machine and everyone else is an edge case. So they hired Nicola Pello to develop the line mode browser. It's text only. You don't even have to install it. Any device with an internet connection can log into the CERN servers and browse the web. And this becomes the mission statement of the W3C, web for all, web on everything. And everything is a lot of things. There's so many different things that the web is on. And that includes devices without any screen or visual display at all, as well as screen readers, which do read the screen. So are sort of a combination of interfaces. If we really want this to work, web for all, web on everything, then uh, we get some interesting constraints. And these are documented on the first website, the HTML documentation that was launched around 1991, and is also still online. You can go read that as well. And it says, browsers should ignore tags, which they do not understand, and ignore attributes, which they do not understand, of tags which they do. So browsers should ignore tags they don't understand. So you can see here, hopefully, in this code, um, I've inserted a lot of tags that aren't real. They're just fake tags. I made them up. Um, and the browser is ignoring them. And it displays the tags that it understands. And it displays the content inside of those tags. It's also ignoring uh, attributes that I made up. Um, that's become very useful as we start doing web components and custom attributes. Um, this was planned from the beginning. The goal is to protect content over code. The code is optional. The content is essential. Whatever else happens, browsers should protect the content. And that's why we can still see this first website on modern browsers. And we can also load modern browsers, modern websites on the first browser. Uh, this is an emulator you can go play with of the www browser. Uh, you don't see. Sorry, right, that's a lot of noise. Um, you don't see CSS and images, but all the text is there. You can see the International Symposium website and uh, my Cascading Style Systems Workshop website. Uh, they load fine, and the content is preserved. This limitation becomes even more dramatic for graphic design. In order for HTML to be a common language between all platforms, uh, we can't have any device-specific markup or anything which requires control over fonts and colors. That's in the original documentation. Web design will never happen, at least in the graphic sense. And the problem isn't styling documents online. That's easy enough. And all of the early browsers provided internal style sheets. Uh, even the text-only browser, uh, you can see it has all caps headings and space between paragraphs. So there's styles happening here. Uh, but the styles are provided by the browser, so there is the same across all websites. They depend what browser you're using. And this is fundamentally different from print design, right? Where we get to describe everything about our page. In fact, we describe the page itself. How big is it? And then it stays that size forever. It's static. So we can export to a PDF or a JPEG or send it to the printer. And what we get back is exactly what we designed. And you can click on it all you want. Nothing's going to happen. It just sits there. The same was true for other digital formats at the time. PostScript had been around for almost a decade. That's 
the basis of PDFs, which came slight, oh, I think around the same time. It's a page description language. So like print, we describe a static page. How big is it? Where does each thing go? And then we set the fonts and colors, etc. We get all the control in those systems, but that control comes at a cost. The page, print or PDF, is a static medium. It can't adapt to context or preferences. Uh, and that's a limitation of the medium. Go read John Alsop's Tao of Web Design from 2000. It's still relevant. I won't wait. Um, web styles have to be different. They have to be contextual. Even static sites aren't static. What we ship is not always what our audience sees. So styles must adapt to all the different situations where they might show up um, because the web is responsive to context, and that's a political vision from the beginning. Not just the width of the viewport, but user needs and preferences, device interfaces, and changing capabilities over time. In other words, we're not alone. We're part of an ecosystem here, and our decisions impact other people. We don't get final say. We're collaborating with the browsers uh, who are instructed to ignore us when we go off the rails. Uh, and we're also collaborating with the people who interact with our sites on their chosen devices with varying capabilities with the browser that they choose and wearing these handy little tool belts that I think are very cute. And we're probably also collaborating with aliens. Maybe who knows uh, if they're around, we should collaborate with them. They're just trying to get home. The CHSS proposal is explicitly designed around this collaboration. That's how the document starts. Uh, this proposal tries to soften the tension between the author and the reader. Uh, it's specifically for that. And if conflicts arise, the user should have the last word. Uh, and that uh, is built into the cascade itself. It's the first step of the cascade is that the user styles can override the author styles when it's important from step one, origins and important. When the user marks a style important, they take priority over everything. That's the purpose of importance. It's not for us to get in petty squabbles and stomp around force choking our colleagues, uh, but to maintain balance in the universe and give power back to the, I don't know, rebel users. I don't know, analogies are hard. A Jedi uses importance for knowledge and defense, never for attack. This also becomes a core W3C principle. If a trade-off needs to be made in the design of the platform itself, always put user needs above all. So under these sort of absurd constraints, design seemed almost impossible on the web. If we want this political vision, how are we going to control fonts and colors? For example, we can't. Um, but nobody was happy with that outcome. Uh, when every site looks the same, that's not just boring for people who are trying to brand their product. Uh, it's kind of boring for everybody. Uh, people like design. Um, the turning point came in 1993 when Mosaic added the image tag to HTML. This was before web standards. Web styles were suddenly possible through the image tag. You could just throw everything into an image, uh, and then when it breaks, there's no content to protect. Um, this fundamentally breaks everything that was special uh, about the political vision of HTML. Uh, if it doesn't load, it's just lost. This was a real risk to the platform. The web could have become a giant fax machine where pictures of text would be passed along. Uh, so there's a real race uh, between 1993 and 1994, a rush of different proposals trying to figure out how are we going to get styles on the web uh, that don't break what makes the web special. Um, I recommend checking out a bunch of these. They're really fascinating. Uh, but all of them talk about this problem. Allow the authors, that's us building the web, uh, to attach style hints. Styles, not rules, but hints and suggestions. This phrase shows up over and over in many of the proposals provide hints that the browser may or may not use. Again, we're drawing from HTML's rules there. Uh, sometimes it's in all caps, a set of hints or suggestions to the renderer which might be used. Uh, in Hokum's proposal, 
authors and publishers have stylistic influence without resorting to page description languages. That's called out specifically. We're not giving us full control, uh, only the ability to provide some influence. Um, and this uses the same resilient logic as HTML. And we can see that again. Did I leave that tab open? I did not. Let's just go back to it. So in CSS, I've done the same thing. I'm calling colors that don't exist. Oh, I must have. That became content. Um, I'm using uh, colors that don't exist. I'm using entire declarations that don't exist, uh, selectors that don't exist. Everything can just be ignored, and it's fine. That's how CSS is designed. Uh, we can be ignored. Um, and this is the reason that the default overflow is visible. If we get cocky and make a box too small for our text, browsers will try to bail us out, not because it's the best looking solution, but because the web will try to protect content whenever it can. Browsers are helping us out here. Um, this is another design principle of the W3C. Content should be viewable and accessible by default, and the browser ensures that that's the case unless we go in and mess it up. InDesign doesn't have to worry about something like this. Accidental overflow can be found and fixed before we hit publish or after we get a proof and then fix it. Uh, and then once it's fixed, it stays the way we designed it. It's not going to change. It's not going to move. Uh, but we're doing graphic design of unknown content with unknown collaborators on an infinite and unknowable canvas across operating systems, interfaces, languages, writing modes. It's absurd what we're trying to do here, what this language is trying to accomplish. Uh, I don't know any other uh, tool that is trying to do this in design. There are too many variables to consider. The point of CSS is to make it so we don't have to worry about all of them. Uh, we hand some of that over to the browser. That's why CSS is a declarative language. We literally write our hints as declarations, a property, and a value. And some of those can seem like simple concepts. The width of a box, 500 pixels. Some are a little bit more abstract. Wrapping text so that it looks pretty, whatever that means. Um, but even the concept, concepts that seem simple hide a deeper complexity. Should our box be smaller on a screen that has a higher resolution? Like, what do we mean by a pixel? And how does that unit respond to zooming in or zooming out? And are we talking about the width of the content where the padding and border are additional to that width or the width of the whole box with the borders and padding? There's not one universal answer. It depends on what we're doing. And maybe we really don't want the width at all. We're thinking about the inline size, the size available to a line of text. Um, or maybe we should be sizing the box based on its contents, their min size or their max size, or the size of a character in the font we're using, or based on context, a parent element, a viewport, a container, or some combination of those, like the minimum of two values. Everything in CSS is based on this constant back and forth, context pushing in, defining the space available, and then content pushing out, taking up space. Uh, and we're trying to make those two always work together. How do we ensure that our content will fit any container that we put it in? We can't. Uh, we don't have all that information. We don't know. But the browser does have that information. So if we want this power, we have to give up some control. The most useful parts of CSS express this kind of abstract behavior, letting the browser work out the details. If we can avoid touching it, we should. The browser knows more than we do. So we're using an expressive language, not describing the page in step-by-step -step detail, but expressing high-level concepts. Our job is poetic providing subtext for the browser, not just the resulting style, but the purpose of a style choice. Uh, and units are great for this. And it's why CSS has so many units, because they help convey this meaning and intent. So 1M and 16 pixels may, in some cases and by default, look the same, but they have very different meanings. They adapt differently in different contexts. 
So our job is not to make it look good on my device, but to make sure it adapts uh, to different contexts uh, as needed, uh, adapting to unexpected changes in the context. Similar with layout methods, uh, flex and grid can give us the same result in a static setting, but they move differently, they behave differently. There's, it's useful to learn both uh, because they're going to act differently in different contexts. Uh, so even when we can get the same result, they have different meanings and that's worth paying attention to. We're trying to express more meaning with fewer constraints. Uh, expressing our intent clearly using hints and suggestions for the browser. So to me, this meme, uh, the CSS is awesome box breaking meme, it actually perfectly captures what is awesome about CSS and how much can go wrong when we try to control things that we shouldn't necessarily control, when we add too many constraints at once. So how can we loosen our grip on this? There's several things that we can do. Um, we could change the, we could remove the width and height constraints and, uh, oh, we could keep that font size. Let's see. Yeah, I mean, we could, uh, the height's not gonna do much in this case, but the width there, that's gonna help. Um, we could even say the min width is min content and otherwise we leave the max height and width. Uh, we could change this to uh, overflow wrap break word. Um, we could play with hyphens or uh, we could, yeah, if we're going to break word there, we might want to get rid of the max height. Um, so we could decide whether we want the height to move or the width to move. Um, we can change overflow to clip or scroll, uh, get all sorts of different ways that we can mess with this box. I mean, I think. The most fun is just, there we go. CSS is rad. That fits perfectly in our box. Um, yeah, so I love that meme uh, for the wrong reasons. To avoid harm, we don't want to describe a static page, but express a design vision through hints and suggestions, help the browser understand the constraints that are important for our design so that when things change, browsers can adapt to, uh, can adapt our design to those changes. Um, we're designing systems. In fact, I would say a cascading style sheet is a design system. It is a set of guides for maintaining cohesive design across a variety of contexts. It's the kind of design system that a browser can read and do something with. Um, to avoid harm, we use a light touch. Uh, we define the outer boundaries, the, the constraints of our design, rather than every little detail. We provide hints uh, pro uh, that help the browser understand our goals, that let the browser take care of the details. This is our job as designers, design engineers, whatever we want to call ourselves. Everything else in CSS is built around this political vision to protect the content, protect the user, and our first responsibility is not to break that. Thanks.